Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. Ladies and gentlemen, for our fourth presentation today, it is entitled Securing the Industrial Internet of Things. Here to give that presentation today is Peter Reynolds, the Process Industry Senior Consultant and Analysis from ARC Advisory. And with over 20 years of experience, Peter is an expert in IT, automation application, process control, and others. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Reynolds. First of all, I want to thank uh, the Minister of Oil, KPC, and Equate Petroleum for the opportunity to come here. This is my first time to Equate. I left uh, Canada and it was 12 degrees and it's now 43 degrees and I'm really struggling with it. But there's a couple of things that, it, um, that I heard today that really resonated with me. And I heard from the panel this morning uh, that the importance of the unification of IT operations in business, taking a risk point of view, and ultimately the people process and technology, but looking at a big P, a big P, and a little T. I think I heard that. That's the importance of the emphasis where we think it, uh, it matters most. And the other thing that I, I heard was a question that came from the audience, and it was about whether or not systems will change. And uh, the research uh, that my company is conducting, we actually think uh, that systems will change. So my presentation today, we're going to focus a little bit more on the I of the innovate portion of your conference. Um, colleagues uh, of mine gave me some coaching before I came to Kuwait and we talked about the abstract that we'd put forth to, to have the opportunity to speak with you. And we, we suggested some things like cloud computing and security and internet of things. And I had a little feedback that I did here was, don't talk to them about the internet of things. But I'm going to talk to you about the Internet of Things today because we think that it's a game changer and it's going to be very important for cybersecurity. And so this is my presentation called Securing the Industrial Internet of Things. Uh, what we're going to talk about first of all is industrial control systems and how they've evolved. We're going to talk about the changing landscape for uh, ICSs. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a survey that my company has done around uh, cybersecurity services, and we, uh, ultimately I want to talk about some gaps and recommendations. Uh, so about me, uh, I'm an analyst. Uh, I've got about uh, 20 years in the oil and gas industry. Uh, I come from uh, a refinery in eastern Canada, where this is a picture that I, I took one day while flying overhead. This is a 325,000 barrel per day refinery, where I spent approximately 18 years implementing a very large single supplier automation system, various PLCs and process information systems to allow my business to do what it needs to do, and that's to buy opportunity crudes and make uh, refined uh, gasoline uh, products. Uh, I now work for a company called ARC Advisory Group, and I'm a, an analyst and a consultant where I've been uh, uh, working for three years. And just a little bit about my company uh, ARC Advisory Group, uh, I saw one of the presentations earlier, there was a couple of ma uh, magic quadrants from uh, analyst firms. My firm doesn't do magic quadrants, but we focused on industrial control systems. So that, that is our expertise. Uh, the company's been in business for almost 30 years, and we hire people out of industry that like to talk about uh, automation and control and IT technologies and are passionate about what they do. Uh, we do have a global presence with offices in Canada, headquartered in the USA, Germany, and Japan, and a few other regions. And some of the clients that we work with. Uh, we actually work with uh, many of the suppliers that uh, are here at this conference today. Uh, we also work with uh, several owner-operators uh, and help uh, and consult on technology and help to navigate some of the, uh, the intricacies of deploying technology. And 
To start the presentation, I thought this was really fitting because uh, uh, one of the things I want to highlight is the evolution of industrial control systems. So I found this nice slide from a control system in 1960s, and we can all marvel at that, and many of you have been in control rooms that I'm sure look an awful lot like that. And we have an industrial control system that looks much like this today. So who can detect the difference? Um, I'm going to take a guess that um, the operations don't do that much that's very different. The big difference between this picture with the board-mounted pneumatic controllers and electro electronic controllers and this one is the internet and commercial off-the-shelf technology. So basically what we've done is we've transformed the jobs, we've added responsibility, we've reduced the number of operators, but we basically haven't changed the operation that much. So what is an ICS? So this is how we would see an industrial control system. We know that it includes pro programmable logic controllers, DCSs. We'd put field sensors uh, into this bucket. We'd look at electrical systems, HMI. But the question is, is what else is part of the ICS? What else is critical to your business that you need to be thinking about in terms of securing infrastructure? So if you remember the original Purdue model from uh, 1980s, the uh, computer integrated manufacturing, it looked a little bit like this, although I've seen various uh, versions of this from ISA 95 and other standards, and ARC developed a collaborative production uh, model that uh, basically describes how systems should work together. So basically what we're looking at here is continuous batch and logic and all the things that deal with the real-time systems down at the bottom, and you've got manufacturing and production systems, and then finally ERP. So what we're finding is as many of the clients that we talk to, they're starting to look at ICS more holistically, and that is we understand the real-time systems, the PID control, the plant safety, we get that, but what we're starting to see is these systems are coming closer together, and we're starting to see that the systems that actually exist up in the level four and the enterprise are becoming more critical to the operation. So we also recognize that um, this is not an industry that adopts a revolution. We think that these things have evolved. And if you, th if you think about that picture that I showed earlier of the board controllers, the pneumatic controllers, those things weren't changed overnight. And actually studies that we show, we, we would say that there is $65 billion of legacy equipment that still exists out there. So there's lots of refineries and chemical plants that still have some of those controls in place. So we know that uh, these systems tend to evolve. You never change out all the systems at once, you de-bottleneck your facility, you add production, you increase complexity of your refining, you take more crudes, so you add on a bit, and you add on a bit. So what tends to happen is a server becomes an afterthought, or a network, or a switch becomes an afterthought. So you ended up with these islands of stranded data. So there tends to be a lot of focus on appliances and security measures, and some of the procedures and policies are not keeping up. We know that sometimes the, the staff are busy focusing on operations and maintenance, and some of the tasks, as we've talked about today, are not really being addressed. So the Purdue model shows enterprise at the top and ICS at the bottom. We've talked a little bit about this, but if you're on the corporate side, this is how you see your world. Uh, all the sites are all numbers. They, uh, they may have an asset tag, but more likely, all these computers and, syst and, and systems are managed by the corporate side, and these sites are just black boxes. This is the traditional view. On the, uh, on the automation side, this is much of the way that your, your ICS systems have evolved. Starting with uh, programmable logic controllers and HMIs, you build your network networks and these things uh, creep. So one of the things that's, uh, that's happened with the, um, the old control room versus the new control room, it's Ethernet and it's switches and it's the internet technology which has really changed all of this. But essentially an ICS still does some basic functions. It does proportional, integral, derivative, handles alarms, provides information to an operator. That part has not changed. Okay? But what we've done is we've introduced a lot of complexity with this new technology and we've allowed it to creep. So I've got uh, the, the two different uh, uh, bodies here. I've got automation and enterprise, and there are some major differences. And even though a server is a server, you could say the automation people are still reporting to one master, and that's automation. So the automation person designs infrastructure with operations requirements. And many of these actually come from the suppliers of the technology because they know how to do it. 
but the enterprise has got a different master. So we know that the infrastructure is very similar, but we know that uh, the leaders are leveraging best pr uh, practices and standards. So on the automation side, as we found, found it today, we, we've had a good presentation on ISA 95. A lot of the standards for the deployment of this technology come from standards just like ISA 95, but they also come from the supplier in many cases, whether it be Honeywell or Emerson or Siemens or whichever the company might be. But on the enter enterprise side, they have a different master. Again, they report to the CFO and CO, and they're talking different standards. So we do recognize that there is a clash that currently takes place across the, uh, the organization. We also understand that there's different priorities on the data. So of course, we know that we can't auto-patch uh, uh, operator screens, and auto-patching on the enterprise side is just a nuisance, but we tolerate it and we let our enterprise IT do what they, they need to do. Um, on, the, on the corporate side, they value differently. They, it's actually classified uh, in terms of um, what uh, the, the enterprise would say is confidentiality is number one, integrity and availability, of course. And if you're on the automation side, the actual inverse is true. So 99.9999 is probably likely for an automation system, as you know. Um, what we are seeing is, is that many companies are starting to invest in a, in a culture where manufacturing IT is becoming more and more embedded into the business. So these IT skills are still required because we still have all the servers required for ICS, but we understand that there's a lack of uh, education and awareness for the, the folks that are, that are responsible. Um, let's talk education. So when you go to school nowadays, you're prepared, you've got your chemical engineering degree, your electrical engineering degree, You've got all the basis that you need to know to go take a job with a petrochemical or chemical refinery and uh, look after plant automation. But the reality is, is that uh, you don't get adequate training about the IT. Um, you take your training from your, uh, your automation supplier about how to uh, maintain and patch and do configuration changes and wire up I.O. modules, but again, there's limited uh, skills with the, um, with the IT side. So all this is happening, and we've watched the systems creep and creep for years, and we've kept up the best we can. We've got limited resources and li limited budgets, and then we have something new. And I, I mentioned earlier that um, the question it w uh, came up earlier in the session, it was, well, patching is a nuisance, and it's a 34-day cycle. Well, why can't we just change the infrastructure? Why can't we change the system? And although I, I don't see an evolution, uh, I, don't, I don't see a revolution going to be taking place, I do, I do see an evolution taking place, and that's in this thing called the Industrial Internet of Things. So what is it? So if you've, uh, by the way, how many people have heard of the Internet of Things? Can you just raise your hands? There's a few, good, okay. So we think it starts with this. Uh, we think the Internet of Things is not just about connecting machines and having robots and, and have workers be replaced because we actually think that people are a very important portion of the industrial internet of things. So what is it? Is it real? And if this thing called the industrial internet of things is happening, well, what is it going to do to our ICS systems and are our practices ready? So what is it? Um, basically, the, under, the, the industrial internet of things is a... Uh, it's a framework, it's a standards body, it's a kind of a syntax that's being developed by several suppliers and, and academia in order to make things work. So we've been trying for years to try and do data integration and bring context and have everything in one display so that an operator or a maintenance or an engineer can look at things in context and make the right decisions and we haven't actually been doing that well at that job. So the Internet of Things is quite interesting because there's a, there are some key bodies that are taking place. There's a European group called the IOTA, which is uh, being funded by groups like SAP and Siemens, some other standards institu institutions, some switch uh, uh, manufacturers, to basically build a framework and decide on how to make things talk. What is the syntax? What is the grammar? What structure should we, should we use? And of course, on the plant side, we have ladder logic, construction set, function block, build it all into displays, build your, your group displays, build it into a historian, but those structures don't 
port well when you move them between technologies. And we can, we can look at the, the, how, how expensive migrations are when we try to move from one DCS or one PLC to the next. So the Internet of Things is kind of, kind of different. And so there's a couple of things. There's some people taking interest in this and spending money, and there's some new technologies coming aboard. So the question is, is that when you are putting assets in your plant, do they all go through the PLC or DCS, or is there another way? So this uh, little uh, picture I've got an, of an SD card shows a computer on a chip. So no more server, no more rack, not required. This is the sort of thing that manufacturers are thinking, well, what if I could embed this low-cost computer into this device? What business value can I derive from that? So the Internet of Things is, is basically a framework to define things like machines or assets, or in this case, I have a turbine, or there's a pump, and this pump has got things associated with it. Uh, it defines physical entities. Um, it defines people and how people use this data. Uh, there's some key parts here in terms of, well, what are the parts of the in, in, uh, internet, internet of Things that are tied into, uh, into data? There's intelligent assets. Uh, there's sensors that, uh, that, that uh, are, um, are part of it. Uh, it's, well, where do you host all this stuff? And, and actually cloud-based and data storage is defined in this. Um, there's the software side, because of course you can't do anything uh, with all of this data, and actually until you start including the people and the processes that are going to be defined. So part of this is the people, and this is all included in these new standards uh, that are being developed. But again, this is not about building codes and doing thing, things the traditional way. This is about a new way to connect assets to your plant. Uh, I had a conversation with a chap here earlier, and it's like, well, we look at, we look at what's in our plant, and, and today the only way that we've, ha we've been able to tie data into our systems, and that's going up through one through four, up to the enterprise, is through a DCS, or through a historian, or through a PLC. But this is the part of the inf infrastructure that's changing. So what is it? It, uh, it includes uh, a definition of an application platform. It includes a definition of what uh, the, this, the, uh, the, the uh, framework calls a virtual machine. And it, it, it includes definition of grammar, of protocols, and, and technology. So this is sort of where IoT is going. And for process industries, you know, this is sort of the things that might be important. Um, you've got a lot of variables associated with this pump to make it work. You know, you want this pump to be low cost, you want it to be reliable, you don't want to have excess spare parts, you, don't, you want to make sure that it's got the right um, availability so you can run your particular process. So these are all types of, of, of information that actually we're tying into DCSs now, and we're giving them to operators, and we're over-alarming our DCS systems, but the question is, is should it be there? So this is the sort of thing that IoT starts to define, and it builds a framework so you could easily get this done. And the, and the, the key here is, is, is in all of this is it's low cost. So in this case, this is a theoretical example we've put together. This is, we've used gold, uh, gold pumps. Um, they are not actually uh, doing this. We've got XYZ Chemical Corporate. We've got an OEM. So we actually see IoT as being something that just not just enables low-cost infrastructure and connectivity using wireless or using, um, using cell phone radios, any way you can get the data out. So you think of this as a little bit like a parallel path. But the business opportunity here is, is how can we be lowest cost provider of chemicals to a region? How can we ensure availability and make sure that things are available? So the, uh, some of the applications we're thinking about are real-time condition monitoring, data visualization, personal safety, asset utilization, all these things, you can uh, build a business case around all of these. So this is, uh, I alluded to this a little bit before, but basically what you have on the left-hand side with planned operations, you've seen many architectures that look like that before. So the idea of IoT is it will change the planned infrastructure. So the, instead of having a one direct path through your automation system, it goes off to a private or a public cloud. And uh, this is just an example of why we need to be thinking about some of these things. Um, some of the reasons why we don't do activities around IT today is because they're expensive. So we know that operating cost of IT is about actually 90% of the spend. So what happens is, is a lot of these activities around management tools and support and backups and disaster recovery, they actually don't get done in many cases. 
The, um, something that, that uh, I touched upon earlier in terms of the definition of the, the model for IoT is the use of cloud. So what we're seeing is, is this data is actually going off-site, and these clouds are not your on-premise -prem data center, and actually they don't look anything like your on-premise da data center, and the services that are behind that don't look anything like it as well. So basically, when you, when you decide to buy an application or build something, whether it's a historian or a production management system or an, or an enterprise system, if you're going to do it on-premise, you own everything. So on the left-hand side, you, you're responsible for everything from the servers to the acquirement, all the middleware and all the, all the storage. On the right-hand side, uh, the cloud service provider manages all of this. So think of it like software on a service. And the same way you download apps on your iPhone, that's the way the cloud works. And this is all defined in the I IoT specification. And what does it look like? Uh, looks like an average warehouse. I'm using Microsoft as an, as an example here. Um, and inside, it looks like this. And inside again, it looks like this. There are other cloud service providers that are providing IoT type services. And uh, the fact is, is that most of us can't keep up to this. Uh, just a little bit on, um, on, the, on the service providers and some of the names that you might, might know of. Uh, these types of solutions uh, in terms of software as a service are already being delivered in, using cloud services. Uh, I'm just going to skip through some of these because I've got uh, a little bit short on time. So why is all this important? So th there's, there's going to be a trade-off between how much do we, do we invest by, in the data and the services and the people and the processes on site, how much do we invest in security versus how much do we pay to service providers in the cloud. So this is an example of Microsoft and there are others, Amazon Web Services and AT&T and uh, HP will have standards that they're following. I've chosen Microsoft in this case just because we're seeing Microsoft has got more software as a service for industrial applications. But I'd recommend um, this, this presentation will be available afterwards as you have a look at what these standards are and see what they mean and, and, and just get a feel for how big they are. Most customers that we talk to, they can't keep up with these types of standards. So what does this mean, IoT? So a lower cost for manufacturers, better optimization, new applications. And most folks that we talk to, there's the, the, always the desire to do things, do more with less. And I'm just going to skip through some of these. So what do we need? So we need to have good uh, knowledge of cybersecurity, data analytics. We have to understand HANA and Hadoop, virtualization. These are all, these are all skills that a modern programmer for an asset management system or real-time condition monitor monitoring, somebody that's an IoT engineer of the future, they're going to require these types of skills. Many of these skills are not available today in the plants. And uh, this is a bit of an eye chart, but this is an example in the smart grid space of some folks that are actively working on this area. I'm just going to skip through that. So are we prepared? So this is the real question. So have we made the right investments? Um, how can we drive more value? How can we get more out of the, the current asset, assets? What roles need to change? And so we think already that perhaps this gap between IT and automation maybe can be better, uh, 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 could be more, more easily done by implementing IT with automation. So um, I may not get through all this because I'm getting very low on time, but I'm gonna go quickly through this. And it was a bit of a fire hose of, uh, of information. Um, but I'll be available a after this for any, any questions, should they arise. Um, one of the things that my company does, besides do consulting and analyzing the market and market studies, every now and then we get the opportunity to do a survey of what end users are doing about, about cybersecurity. So I, so I said earlier that I, th I think infrastructures will change, we think ICSs will change, so we think it's actually, you're right, we're not ready Currently, we do not have the right, uh, the right uh, people, process, and technology in, in place, but we think it's the new technology and the innovation that's actually going to drive the investment in cybersecurity. So this is uh, results from a, um, a survey of, I think it's 120 companies uh, that we did last year in terms of their practices and, uh, and processes and in, uh, in, uh, industrial security. So um, ultimately, let me see, I'll just, I'm going to share some of these results with you. So basically, there was about 15 questions. It took 30 minutes. 
We sent it out through various uh, publications to try and solicit uh, feedback. And a lot of the things that we, that we got back were things that really confirmed, but I th we thought it would be really, be really important to share with you. So there's 107 companies available in this survey. And again, this will be available for you to download and share with your organizations if, it, if it's helpful. But the, pr the, primary, um, the primary users of, of, the, of, uh, of, or of the survey were end users. But we, of course, we did get uh, input from uh, technology pro uh, providers and system integrators, et cetera. And um, they, they tended to be a heavy process focus. So we know that chemicals and refining and upstream oil and gas and pulp and paper were, were the main people that participated in this survey. And what else do we have here? We got mainly North America to respond to our survey, but that didn't mean that we didn't get good balance and good uh, distribution across other countries. And let's see, oh, I think I went through one here. And we asked the, the, the people that uh, participated in this survey about uh, what are the drivers for their various programs. And this is sort of what we expected. You know, we start with, it's all about process and safety. We had, had to maintain uptime, process integrity, and of course, this is ICS we're talking about. It wasn't uh, enterprise. Information confidentiality was not highest on the priority list. Um, so the next question was, how would you uh, the, the, uh, the, the characterize the organization concern with cybersecurity issues? So most people actually were more concerned about accidental changes to programs, data control, internal threats, disgr disgruntled em employees, and less concerned about hacktivists and increased vulnerability of wireless networks. So again, that was, this was very expected. And ultimately, we asked uh, people how they would um, how they would rank their, their centralization or decentralization of, uh, of, of governance. And uh, policy, we, we're, we're certainly seeing as being more centralized. Uh, the next question was around uh, I, uh, ICS uh, cybersecurity. And one of the things that was, was interesting about this, this allotment of IT versus uh, of ICS, we're actually seeing more and more IT being involved in control systems and PCs and historian upgrades. So, so th this is a, a shift. And uh, sorry, the next question here. And um, to what extent will you, uh, you, uh, external parties be used for cybersecurity in the next three years? So, th so the interesting thing about this question is that we learned that there is a recognition that end users or owner operators are requiring more help. They need help from outside. So this is consistent with all of, of everything we're seeing from upgrading the automation systems and the PLCs and the DCSs to we need help with uh, IT security as well. Um, in terms of endpoint uh, technology, technologies, we asked uh, how well they were, they were doing with these types of technologies. And again, it's, it gets top of the list, of course, was uh, antivirus. Uh, host intrusion detection, whitelisting, uh, security event management, and, and analytics, these were all on the rise. Uh, the next one was, uh, was quite interesting because we posed the question about next gener generation firewalls, and many of the respondents didn't know quite what a next generation firewall was in terms of uh, deep packet inspection and looking at uh, traffic flows. So this is interesting, and it just illustrates that I think we've got a little ways to go with cybersecurity. Um, and in terms of prioritization, everybody said, you know, we need to do it all. There was a recognition of better tools for managing security, for updates, tools for checking vulnerabilities. We had to do it all. Um, let me see here. The last, I've only got a couple minutes left. I see my time is getting very short here. Uh, let me see here. Um, so basically, what are the constraints? What's holding us back? And basically, it was... It was consistent with other, other surveys we've done. Lack of understanding of IT, lack of, of resources. But the other big thing was is the inability to show a payback. And this is why I was talking so much about the Internet of Things, and we think the Internet of Things is going to drive this, because when you contemplate, contemplate doing something different, uh, a new business model, that's where you're going to get the financial payback. So the business case is going to be including cybersecurity in the future. So conclusions, we, we know about the work process and the technology gaps and we're working on those. We know about the interactions between automation and IT and how they need to work closer together. And we know that these systems are becoming more and more complex. 
Um, we know that uh, uh, we're going to continue to suffer from a lack of experts in, uh, in each plant, and they're becoming harder and harder to find. And we think that IoT is going to change the landscape for the better, and that safety and production will only increase. And new low-cost uh, IoT architectures are going to drive cybersecurity investments. And uh, supplier service providers uh, of ICS will deepen the leverage of international standards. And I did see somebody talking a little bit about this today, as most of these IT standards have got maturity models, so you can implement them to the degree that makes sense for your organization. So some of these are ITIL and COBIT and, and ISO 27001. And the liberation of the data is going to drive the investments in the, in the future. And I think that's the last slide. And there's only five seconds left. That was pretty close. I think I timed that on purpose. Um, did we want to have a question or two, or do you want to wait till you come and find me later? So, so I'm available um, for the next uh, couple of days. Please uh, look me up, and I'd like to hear your feedback and your questions and comments. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Reynolds, and thank you very much. To reiterate what he has just said, he is with us for the next 48 hours, so you may bombard him with as many questions as you can summarize over the next uh, 36 hours. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.